It's a great pleasure to uh, be here and uh, thank you very much for coming and thank you very much Vinod for the very generous introduction. Uh, so uh, despite the title of this talk, it's a theory of computation talk. So, um, and uh, it's going to be about uh, generative adversarial networks, which I think is a very interesting area uh, uh, of um, a lot of debate in the machine learning community, but also a lot of interesting theoretical problems to actually be tackled. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, two aspects of it. One is uh, using game theory to uh, try and improve uh, the current training of uh, 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 generative adversarial networks and uh, then uh, using statistics to try to resolve uh, statistical uh, challenges that uh, abound uh, and have to do with whether these things actually learn anything or not, okay? Uh, and have how to really make them learn. So, uh, first of all, what is the problem that these uh, 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 GANs are, are trying to solve? It's a very classical one, uh, uh, which is that of getting, uh, you know, what, what is a generative model where uh, getting a generative model is the challenge uh, in which uh, you're given, uh, let's see, is this working? Oops. Uh, uh, you're given, uh, you're given uh, data uh, from uh, uh, the real world, uh, presumably sampled uh, IID from some uh, world distribution, and you want to uh, come up with a model that generates samples from the same distribution. Uh, so that's the challenge, right? So you want your model to be close to the real world distribution in some way. And uh, the challenge is that uh, interesting distributions are high dimensional and are not parametric. So you have to do something about that. Now, uh, generative adversarial networks uh, uh, try to tackle that uh, without actually keeping track of a density function. Okay, so they do not want to parameterize explicitly the density function that uh, samples uh, those uh, real world items and trying to learn the parameters of the function. Instead, they want to learn how to generate samples from that same distribution. So in particular, what they want to do is they want to find a function f that uh, will eat uh, boring samples, that is Gaussian samples, and spit out interesting samples, that is samples from a real world distribution of interest. Uh, and in particular, you want to use a function that is powerful enough, so you wanna, you're going to pick uh, from a family of uh, uh, rich enough uh, functions. And uh, you know, the recent trend, starting from the work of, of Goodfellow uh, a few years ago, is to stick in their uh, deep neural network, whose parameters are, are, are to be tuned so that uh, this generation process does a good job. Now, uh, uh, I'm guessing you all know what a neural network is, and uh, for the purpose of this talk, uh, at least uh, you know, uh, for the most part of this talk, uh, it won't matter what the architecture of this deep neural network is. So for us, uh, a deep neural network is a parameterized function. Uh, it's parameterized by some parameters theta, which maps a low dimensional vector z to high dimensional space, uh, uh, in, giving you an x. So x and theta, the parameters are high dimensional, z, the input, is low dimensional. And what's important is that this function is, uh, is almost everywhere differentiable with respect to both theta and x. So now the goal in uh, training uh, a generative model like that is to set the parameters theta so that the output distribution looks uh, like the real world distribution of interest. And what you're going to do is you're going to use samples from the real world distribution to, in some way, and we're going to talk about that, tune the internal parameters of this uh, function so that the output distribution is similar to the real world distribution. So I'm going to talk about how training is happening in just a couple slides. But before that, let me show you some uh, 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 the results of uh, doing that uh, in some data sets, reporting from a uh, couple of papers. So on the right hand side, uh, 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 the paper trains uh, a GAN on uh, the uh, Cella Bay dataset. The Cella Bay dataset has headshots of celebrity faces. So presumably celebrity faces are you know, beautiful faces that are sampled from some uh, 
very nice uh, distribution. And, uh, <laughs> and the goal of training uh, a GAN on this data set is to actually understand something about that distribution and start uh, hallucinating new faces that potentially could be celebrity faces. And uh, these samples are some of the samples of uh, uh, faces that could be celebrities, but actually these are not real people. These are just completely hallucinated uh, uh, headshots. Okay, so these people don't exist. They were dreamt up by a neural net. So are they far from uh, the set of all celebrities? Or is uh, it, you know, each picture is close to a... So uh, that is, uh, yeah, still, I mean, so people have done all sorts of experiments to try to somehow characterize uh, whether or not uh, uh, the output of uh, the GAN uh, is memorizing the input data or really hallucinating new uh, data. Uh, and, but, so there, but, you know, and part of, part of the, you know, the toolkit that you know, my work is trying to develop is trying to characterize that formally. There are some experiments that try to argue for or against uh, 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 you know, the quality, you know, the, the, the whether or not this really learns the target distribution. Uh, so it's still open. So there are some arguments against, but uh, in, uh, not super convincing in my mind. Uh, on the left hand side, you see uh, examples of other GAN outputs. So, on the, uh, for example, upper left, you have a GAN that uh, was trained on church uh, uh, photos, and it generates uh, photos that could be churches, but these churches actually are not real churches, and so on and so forth. Bedrooms, dining rooms, and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, you know, so these are ni nice uh, pictures, but again, uh, there is a big debate about uh, you know what is happening uh, rigorously. Uh, so that's sort of like, uh, you know, like, uh, the, at, least, uh, you know, at, at least exhibits the potential of this uh, technology. Uh, and, and sort of like, uh, here are some other uh, uses, this, here are some uses of GANs uh, that also uh, argue for, you know, the, the big potential of that technology. Uh, these are uses of GANs downstream. So uh, once you have a generative model uh, for an interesting distribution, you can then use it for all sorts of other downstream tasks. And uh, on this uh, uh, slide, I'm, I'm showing a few examples. But uh, you know, you, you may certainly imagine that you know having a good generative model for a distribution of uh, that is complicated can be leveraged uh, to, de for example, denoise images. Uh, you know, like uh, zoom into images when you don't have, don't have the right, you know, like your photo has bad resolution, but you can zoom in. Why? Because you know, uh, you know, you have learned something about the uh, 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 real world distribution from, from which the underlying actual object came from. So you can, uh, you know, use that uh, to, uh, as a leverage to zoom in and, and, and do tasks like that. So there have been a lot of uses, actually, like a ton of papers on how to use GANs for interesting stuff. But uh, for us, uh, we, we're interested in uh, really what's happening under the hood, how to train these things, uh, how to first, first of all set up the training framework, how to uh, use algorithms to train them, and how to use statistics to improve uh, on uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the quantitative guarantees you can make about the output distributions. So that's what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to actually jump directly into how you set up an optimization problem to train these uh, uh, generators. And uh, the perspective I'm going to take is uh, one of the perspectives that uh, I like. And uh, I'm going to describe to you uh, 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 what are called Wasserstein guns. Okay? So again, remember that my goal is to uh, get my hands on a function g of theta, okay? Uh, g for generator, theta are the parameters of the generator. To remember that theta are the parameters of the generator, I'm going to put a subscript of g for generator, okay? So theta g are from now on my parameters. So the goal is to actually train this, to, to, to choose this parameter theta g, so that when my function eats a Gaussian sample, it outputs an interesting uh, sample that's close to a target distribution, in this case, uh, distribution over celebrity faces. So f is going to be the real world distribution of celebrity faces. I, I, don't, I don't really know that distribution, but I have sample access to it, just because I can you know, go online and look at photos of celebrities. q is the output distribution of my GAN, of my, of my, of my generator. So in particular, 
uh, 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 Q is the distribution that uh, you observe if you stick in a Gaussian sample into that generator and uh, get uh, compute the output. So the output distribution is my Q. And Q depends on my choice of theta G. Now, suppose that my goal, like a reasonable goal, uh, is to learn the real world distribution F to within Wasserstein distance, okay? Which is a reasonable distance for comparing images. Uh, I remind you that Wasserstein distance has this uh, definition, uh, which is um, uh, you look over all possible couplings that uh, jointly sample F and Q of uh, some distance uh, between the image X that you sample from F and uh, Y that you sample from Q under your coupling and you minimize overall possible coupling. So the, be the best way to jointly generate from the two distributions to minimize some base distance. So here I'm going to be using the L1 distance, but you can pl plug in other distances there, whatever distance you are interested in. Now, by duality, by mons Kantorovich duality, uh, this infimum is actually equal to a supremum. It's a supremum where all possible test functions d that are one Lipschitz with respect to the uh, metric you were, the, the distance you were using there. Uh, so we're all possible Lipschitz one functions of uh, what would have happened if you ran your test on uh, a sample from uh, F versus a sample from Q. So you're comparing two expectations. You take the supreme over all test functions. If you know the, you know, the worst possible test function cannot distinguish the two distributions, then you have two distributions that are close. So ideally, what I'd like to do, so that's the ideal, yeah. So, um, so uh, F and Q, I should think about it as sort of uh, in separate distributions, and uh, yeah. you're taking infimum over all sort of joint distributions. O over joint distributions that sample an image from X, uh, from F, and an image from Q for the inf side of the... So the marginal side of F and Q, right? Exactly. And uh, for the supreme, you don't have to worry about that. So if, uh, yeah, just, uh, just think of the supreme, which has two different expect separate expectations. Uh, so in the perfect world, in the ideal scenario, what I would like to do is I would like to choose the theta g's, the parameters of my generator, in such a way that uh, I'm uh, minimizing over theta g the supreme, the, the, the worst possible distinguishing I can do between the two distributions overall Lipschitz one test functions. Which of course is a horrible optimization problem to solve because you're going overall t test functions. And uh, you know, like is common in machine learning these days, you replace uh, going over all possible functions with going over a rich enough family of functions. And in particular, what you do is you say, okay, I'm gonna fix an architecture for a, a, a discriminator uh, a judge, okay? So you have the, you know, you have a discriminator, you, it's your judge. You're gonna fix a neural network architecture that has also some free parameters theta d for discriminator. And you're gonna only soup over all possible settings of those parameters theta d. So you set up a min-max problem uh, where you're trying to tune the parameters of the generator trying to generate good images, and you're trying to tune the parameters of the discriminator, trying to do a good discrimination job between the two distributions, the true distribution and the output of the generator. So in particular, you, you know, that's, a, that's not, uh, you know, you're, you're only going over certain functions, so that's not uh, Wasserstein, but it's a metric, okay? So it defines a metric. And you know, from the perspective of the generator, you're trying to minimize that metric. From the perspective of the discriminator, you don't have to compute that metric. All right, but basically what it boils down to is you set up a zero-sum game between the two players. One is tuning the parameters of the generator and another is tuning the parameters of the discriminator. So maybe a picture is uh, better. So, uh, so you have two players. One is controlling what's happening in the uh, green box. The other is controlling what's happening in the blue box. So the generator tries to generate samples that look, you know, so the discriminator is getting inputs uh, from the real distribution and also from generated samples by the generator. And it's trying to distinguish real or, or fake, uh, while the generator is trying to fool that, uh, the discriminator. So you have two players. One is trying to 
fool the other guy, uh, the other, you know, the discriminator is trying to distinguish as, as well as possible. So you have a game between two players, it's a zero-sum game. And uh, <coughs> the way you're going to train it, because this uh, theta d and theta g parameters are high super high dimensional, you cannot solve it, uh, uh, you know, like uh, with a very sophisticated method. So what you're going to do is you're going to run a first order method. So you're going to have the inf player run uh, some variant of gradient descent on his parameters. Uh, the discriminator player run uh, some kind of uh, gradient ascent. And you want that uh, the joint uh, gradient ascent descent procedure uh, gets you a good uh, min-max solution. Uh, and then there's also the matter of expectations, okay, there in the objective function. So in particular, you have an expectation over f. You don't really have access to f. You have only sample access to f. So you're going to be replacing uh, expectations with finite sample averages. Uh, so, um, and you know, again, there is potentially some error coming in there as well, okay? Which in principle you would have to characterize, okay? So, but, you know, what this ultimately boils down to is, you know, after you make all the different approximations, you set up a two-player zero-sum game between an inf player and a sub player, and you have some, you know, objective function that depends on the parameters of one guy and the parameters of the other guy. So this is basically the framework. And uh, a lot of challenges come uh, with this uh, framework. And, and here are some of the identified uh, challenges. Uh, so first of all, uh, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on that, you get training oscillations when you run the gradient descent ascent on a min-max problem. We're going to see why these oscillations occur and how to potentially fix them. Uh, then, uh, you know, you are in a, uh, let's start from the bottom, you're in a high dimensional space. So the optimization procedure you're running is in, in high dimensional spaces, so you are going to be hit by curves of dimensionality one way or another. Uh, then, uh, the way the whole problem was set up, you are not using uh, any underlying information you may have about conditional independence structure in your distribution, so you just blindly set up a uh, black box kind of, uh, you know, like uh, architecture and you're trying to train it, you're not using uh, any knowledge you may have. And uh, related to both uh, issues with uh, uh, the training and the issues with the dimensionality of your data uh, are, you know, uh, 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 issues that uh, point to the direction of uh, Vinod's question, which have to do with am I really learning or am I memorizing things? Am I really catching all the modes of my distribution or you know, focusing on some modes and so on and so forth? So the goal for this talk is to talk about how to use game theory to alleviate the issue with the oscillations and how to use statistics to uh, be able to model dependencies in the, in the distribution and, um, and uh, you know, scale, scale up uh, this technology. So that's a great question, actually. Uh, and uh, it also is related to the question of bounded rationality in game theory. So ultimately, you don't want a super powerful discriminator against a very weak generator, or vice versa. So it's a fine balance that you have to uh, walk. So these guys should have approximately the same power. Otherwise, one may be completely destroying the other guy without uh, giving, him any ch giving a gradient descent any chance to improve. randomness against a class of uh, adverse rate because you're, you're uh, restricting Yeah, if, if, if you want, yeah. <laughs> Somehow, yeah. If, if the distinguishers are small compared to the generator, you... you yeah, exactly. Like That's right. In the other way is cryptographic. Right. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Certainly very uh, uh, interesting connect connection to pseudo-randomness. The only difference, I guess, is that the focus in pseudorandoms mostly for uniform distribution and here we're trying to somehow use this uh, uh, to target the low dimensional structure in your distribution. But of course obstacles uh, that arise uh, in pseudorandomness will inform you about what you can or cannot hope to do here. In any event, let me talk about, uh, talk about training oscillations and how to alleviate them. 
And uh, to begin with, I want to show you some uh, actual uh, training oscillations here. And uh, uh, so the, for my first example, I'm going to look at, some, uh, uh, at a true distribution, which is a mixture of eight Gaussians that are arranged on a cycle. So what if, you know, like it's a two-dimensional problem where you have your sample is uh, from a mixture of these Gaussians and you're trying to train a GAN to uh, output that. So I'm showing you what happens uh, at different steps of training of a GAN. Uh, uh, so, uh, <laughs> and uh, the phenomenon you observe happening is that uh, at different steps of training, the generator is focusing at different modes of the underlying mixture of Gaussians. Okay? So, uh, right, so at step 10k, it's generating from that mode, and then it's moving to that mode, and so on and so forth. So think of it as, you know, like the generator, the discriminator, is, it's hunting down the generator, but the generator is jumping from mode to mode to avoid the hunter. Uh, maybe more, you know, interestingly, uh, this is uh, an example of training oscillations when you're trying to train a GAN that outputs handwritten digits. So in the upper left corner, I'm showing you a bunch of samples from a distribution that outputs uh, handwritten digits. And at the bottom, I'm showing you the uh, output distribution of a, of a generator at different steps of training, which, as the authors of this paper uh, say, uh, are proto-digits. Okay, so like uh, uh, what you see in, in the, at different steps of training is that the generator is singly uh, focusing on a particular proto-digit. Okay, so the two are chasing each other around. Now, uh, from a, a uh, more, as if you want, uh, uh, um, theoretical standpoint, let's even let's try to see you know why these oscillations occur. And the first thing to notice is that actually, uh, training oscillations occur even in the very beneficial scenario where the training objective is not uh, you know uh, crazy, but the min-max objective. Before min-max optimization is the you know a nice objective. So for this experiment, I'm going to actually do something very simple. I'm going to imagine that my two distribution is a two-dimensional isotropic Gaussian. So the min vector is unknown. Uh, I'm going to put it at 3, 4. That's not super important. Uh, you can put it anywhere you want. Uh, so you have an isotropic Gaussian generating the true samples. And then I'm going to set up a very simple GAN architecture to try to learn that distribution. So the generator is going to just take the input, so the generator is getting as input a, a two-dimensional zero min Gaussian, adding to that sample input uh, uh, his vector of internal parameters and outputting that. So in particular, if the generator figures out uh, that uh, three and four as the vector of internal parameters, the generator has learned the true distribution. The, generate, the discriminator is also going to do something very simple. It's going to take his input, projected to a two-dimensional vector and output that. So both generator and discriminator are super simple. And uh, if you write down the uh, wasserstein gan objective that I described earlier, what you get is this very nice min-max optimization problem, which is linear in both the parameters. And if you uh, notice, it has um, uh, as a unique solution that the generator sets his theta g vector to be exactly the mean of the true distribution, 3 and 4, and the discriminator uh, uh, outputs 0, 0. Under this uh, distribution, uh, the min max objective is 0, 0, and no player can improve. If any of the two players deviates from that, the other guy can screw him, okay, and get plus infinity. So that's the only min max solution. And let's see what happens if you run. A uh, gradient descent to actually descent ascent to actually train this objective. What you here is I'm showing you the gradient descent and ascent dynamics uh, for the discriminator's two parameters and for the generator's two parameters. So here I hope you can see there are two curves, one uh, orange and one blue. So on the generator side, you can see that obviously we get oscillations here, as the picture implies. So. Interestingly, the average of the uh, generator's two curves are the right parameters. Okay, so the average of the orange line is 4, and the average of the blue line is 3, as it should be. Okay, that's the target, but they oscillate around the truth. And similarly, on the discriminator side, the average of the two curves is 0, 0, which is uh, what we're shooting for, but uh, it does not converge to these parameters. 
So in particular, if you were to stop the training at some point, you, would get, you wouldn't get the min-max solution. And on this slide, we tried a bunch of variants of gradient descent that have been proposed and used uh, uh, in, in this literature, and they, you know, they all have, uh, they all have. Uh, um, on the right hand side, we see what happens if I actually, uh, instead of doing one step of the discriminator and one step of the uh, um, generator, I do say a bunch of like maybe here ten steps, fifteen steps of one for one step of the other. That uh, improves uh, the situation because it maps it closer to the minimization problem, right? <laughs> So imagine that uh, uh, imagine that the uh, uh, I don't know what this is for. <laughs> and I managed to get rid of uh, what is it? Uh, it's uh, supposed to be sitting on. Okay. So, um, but but yeah. So a, a standard way to avoid to remove or to uh, reduce oscillations is to. Uh, have one like the inner player do a bunch of steps, right? So that the outer player effect effectively is facing a minimization problem. Okay, but unless you go all the way, you will still get oscillations. So from a theoretical standpoint, why do these oscillations occur? So let's let's look uh, deeper into that. So uh, what do we know about uh, uh, optimizing min-max objectives? Uh, maybe the best, uh, the most, you know, uh, nice scenario is when the uh, function that we're trying to min-max is convex in x and concave in y. In, in, in this case, we are actually in the von Neumann uh, uh, theorem, min-max theorem, so which says that min-max is equal to max-min, and in particular also implies that, uh, uh, you know, uh, convex optimization can actually solve this problem. Moreover, starting from the 50s, uh, the, there has been a lot of work in developing simple dynamics that can be run by the min player and the max player in tandem converging to the minimax equilibrium. Uh, some of them are showing, uh, shown here, so for the regular as leader is a powerful one, for the perturbed leader, multiplicative weights update and so on and so forth. Follow the regular as leader is basically a very simple algorithm uh, the, where you know, the min player, the X player, uh, at every step of training, looks at the aggregate, the, the history of the, of, the, of the Y player, and plays an X that is the best response to the uh, average of the Ys. And similarly uh, does the uh, Y player, except uh, uh, they also regularize uh, their choices. Okay? They don't just play the best response to the history of their opponent, but also they add some regularization function there. In fact, if you use as a regularization the L2 square norm, you get exactly gradient descent. So gradient descent can actually be re-derived from this perspective as a no regret learning algorithm. And what has been shown is that these methods converge to the minimax equilibrium in this convex concave setting except that this convergence is very special. So it's not point-wise convergence, but it's convergence in some average kind of sense. In particular, if you look at the trajectory of these dynamics, when the min player and the max player are using a no regret learning method, then the averages of the trajectories are a minimax equilibrium. Okay, so the... So, so you're saying in your example of eight, uh, you, know, you should really not be outputting what the guy says at time t, but an average of... Uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, but except that one is not even a convex concave setting in the mixture of eight, but in the example that I gave, the very simple one with one Gaussian, uh, that's why the average of this trajectory is wo was the right thing. Okay, I don't know if you remember, if you averaged my plots, you got the right solutions, but they were oscillating around. Okay, particularly if the min-max equilibrium is unique, you get that the average trajectories are a min-max equilibrium. So can we show that you know, some variant of these methods will actually work? Uh, we, s we, s we certainly know to get pointwise convergence. We certainly know that no variant of FTRL can uh, get you that. So what we do, we um, actually propose a way to remove the oscillations. Uh, and uh, in particular, we analyze uh, a variant of gradient descent with negative momentum 
that was proposed by Chiang et al. and on which uh, Racklin, Alex Racklin and uh, uh, Sri Varan uh, actually uh, wrote a very nice paper a few years ago. So what is this method? Well, uh, it would be great in descent, except we added this pink term, uh, which is, corresponds to undoing today some of the gradient from yesterday. Okay, that's the negative momentum. Um, so what do we show for this uh, dynamic? I'll show you why uh, uh, this negative momentum may help uh, by showing you a cartoon picture in a little bit. But uh, um, so um, what do we show? We show that uh, uh, this uh, method uh, exhibits last iterate convergence in, uh, uh, by unconstrained by linear games. This is what we showed uh, a year ago. In fact, uh, the convergence rate, as was shown by Liang and Stokes, is exponentially fast if the matrix A is well conditioned. In my previous example of the two Gaussians, if you were to run negative momentum, you would get this very nice picture where the discriminator and the generator are converging to the right solutions. More recently, with uh, Yanis uh, Panayas, who was a postdoc here, we show that uh, the, you know, the right adaptation of this method uh, also works in the constraint setting, which in particular amounts to basically doing all of linear programming. So, uh, you know, it's, known, it's well known that this problem is equivalent to, if you can solve it, it's equivalent to solving linear programs. So we show that in all the generality of that, uh, you know, uh, this negative momentum idea actually exhibits last iterate convergence. The last remark, because before I show you the cartoon picture for why this may work, uh, this method did not just come out of uh, thin air. It actually, there is a very principled way to derive it, and that goes by, uh, 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 by thinking about this follow the regular as leader that I talked about before. Uh, and uh, effectively, what this dynamic is, is what happens if you run what is called optimistic follow the regular as leader. Optimistic follow the regularized leader is a variation of follow the regularized leader where um, instead of the two players playing a regularized best response to their opponent's uh, historical uh, strategy, they upweight uh, the immediate last action of their opponents. Why? Because they think that their opponent is running a smooth algorithm to update their strategies. So it's more likely that their next, next action is going to be close to the immediate previous action. Right? So if you're running uh, dynamics by two players in tandem, and you're running smooth dynamics, it's reasonable to expect that your opponent will actually play something close to what they're doing now. That's why it makes sense to upweight in the history the immediate previous action. And, uh, if you see what FTRL with this optimistic uh, variation uh, means, if you use L2 squared regularization in the same way you got gradient descent before, now you get gradient descent with momentum. Now let's go to my figure that actually is supposed to convince you that at least in the unconstrained setting, this negative momentum is a good idea. So what I'm showing you here is a very trivial function, x times y basically. The only reason I centered it is that my picture was centered at 0.5.5. Otherwise, it's just x times y, both scalars, OK? Uh, and uh, what I'm showing is what would happen if you run gradient descent ascent to solve this problem, this, if you wanted to min-max this objective. So the diamond at the middle is the unique equilibrium. And the trajectory is, uh, represents what happens if I start at the purple diamond and use gradient descent ascent. In particular, you see that it spirals out of the uh, minimax solution, uh, and of course the average of the trajectory is exactly converges, f you know, to that solution. Now, why is momentum a good idea? Here is my cartoon proof of that. <laughs> Let's zoom in to the beginning of the trajectory. This trajectory has this spiral out uh, sort of like uh, uh, shape. So, if I were to do gradient descent, I would just, you know, go to the next point of the trajectory and keep going. But now let's think of what would have happened if I added a little bit of negative of that to, instead of following this gradient here, I also added a little bit of negative of that previous gradient. That ought to push me 
inwards, inside, in, inwards in my spiral you know, orbit. And this is effectively what happens and gets you to the uh, equilibrium. Okay, now you have to make that mathematics, but it, uh, you can. But this is the, if you want to have a mental picture of what's going on in the unconstrained setting, this is what is going on. And to solve the constraint setting, you have to uh, do more work because you have to project your gradient back inside your constraint set every time it, the gradient wants to take it outside. Uh, so the proof uh, is a bit uh, more complex. So the weights, the eta and eta over two, they, I mean, one over two is probably arbitrary, but they uh, uh, so, uh, uh, first of, so eta is the learning rate. Right. Now the question is, why is the ratio two? Uh, that comes by de deriving this met method uh, uh, from uh, FTRL. So two is really two. It's not a. Co it's not a. You know, uh, two is nothing. two because yeah. So I upweighted your previous action by a factor of two, right? So uh, if I were to upweight it differently, you get a different uh, factor. Yeah. So and that would work too. Uh, I, uh, for certain factors, maybe I'll, you know, <laughs> no, okay. okay, it has to be two. Uh, okay, so, um, right, so, so far I talked about convex and cave objectives, but what happens if you take this idea and export it in the Wild West, okay? So in particular, what happens if you look at trying to do non-convex concave functions. So the obvious issue is here that, you know, there may not be a unique uh, min-max solution. And in fact, uh, um, uh, uh, what is an even bigger problem is that uh, 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 you cannot hope that uh, the, the, the stable points of gradient descent or optimistic gradient descent ascent are only local min-max solutions. Actually, the uh, stable points of gradient descent ascent will be, will be more you know, like a, a superset of local min-max solutions. And this picture is supposed to give you an example of that, where for this specific function, where uh, this point there at the middle is actually a stable point for both gradient descent and optimistic gradient descent. And the reason it is stable, but it's not a min-max point, and the reason it is stable is that even though the X player actually, if you're there, the X player wants to escape, what happens is that once he escapes, the other player pushes him down to the diagonal and back to the uh, red point. So stability can arise in this way. If, you know, it's maybe a bit, uh, you wouldn't expect that because, you know, but, but you can have these feedback mechanisms that uh, pin you down to a non-local min-max point. What we can show is that uh, this uh, inclusion holds, and this inclusion may be strict. So in particular, optimistic gradient has more stable points than gradient, which is a superset potentially strict of the local min-max points. So a, a very interesting, in my mind, open question here is to identify a first order method that uh, uh, from you know, measure one initialization converges to the uh, 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 to local min-max solutions. Now, while this is pending, you can still go to the wild world and, you know, apply this method. And this is what we did in that uh, last year paper. We uh, proposed the optimistic variant of the, you know, one of the most used methods uh, in optimizing GANs called ADAM. So ADAM is some variant of uh, uh, gradient descent. Um, that, uh, you know, is widely used, albeit not uh, provably not converging, always. Uh, nevertheless, you can still use this optimistic uh, adaptation to, uh, to modify that method and try to apply it in, in, the, in the real world. And this is what we did. So we looked at uh, the CIFAR-10 dataset and we compared how ADAM, the standard procedure, works versus our optimistic variant of it works. And uh, uh, so in our experiments, without doing any, uh, uh, so let me zoom in a little bit, without doing any fine tuning in the hyperparameters of these methods, using exactly the same ones in Adam and Optimistic Adam, we get uh, significant, uh, statistically significant advantage in the inception score that uh, uh, the two methods uh, achieve. <coughs> 
and here's some of the pictures that we generated, but it's not important. So this is sort of like uh, uh, my segment on uh, training guns, which started from, you know, observing this, uh, uh, starting with the issue of oscillations, looking at it from a theoretical standpoint, then exporting the ideas to the real world and getting an uh, advantage. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, it's interesting to actually more systematically evaluate, uh, you know, how much this advantage is. Okay? So that sort of like concludes my first section. And uh, what I want to briefly touch upon is the statistical uh, challenges that arise, which are super important for rigorously arguing about what GANs are actually doing. So let's go back to my definition. And uh, uh, here, and notice that this inner soup problem is trying to solve a statistical uh, comparison type of problem in particular. Its goal is a proxy, you know, it's a proxy of the distance between two distributions, the output of the GAN and the true distribution. Now, so, so you know, this problem, you know, is solved by means of running gradient descents and, you know, to, 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 to give you a generator. But ultimately, once you have the generator, you'd like to evaluate it. So what does it mean to evaluate a generator? Well, you want to compare the output of the, ge of the generator and the true distribution. So now what do we know about these comparisons? What we know is that uh, it's a very hard uh, problem because it suffers a big curse of dimensionality. And here I'm just showing you a trivial result you can show from the birthday paradox. If you're comparing a high dimensional distribution against a uniform distribution, you need to get exponentially many samples to get uh, to, to, to even approximate the vast system distance between these two distributions. So somehow this high dimensionality, th this uh, high dimensional, uh, th this barrier has to be escaped if you are going to seriously talk about, you know, what, you know how good the output of the generator is. Um, so in particular, what I'm arguing is that you have to exploit uh, in the design of your training procedure, you have to exploit some you know, known or at least postulated structure in the generation of your distribution. A similar problem arises if you want to scale up uh, 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 GANs um, for example, you know, going from images to generating videos, where you have to use, again, some structure of the underlying distribution for you to be able to, to you know, to hope to, to do anything. What I want to explore very sh briefly is uh, how potentially you could exploit base net structure in your distribution. So I hope you're familiar with base nets. If not, here's my attempt to explain them. They're, they're high dimensional distributions defined in terms of a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, which basically specifies how to factorize your distribution. Uh, in particular, your distribution, for example, that DAG there tells you that uh, a distribution compatible with that DAG has this factorization. Because X1 and X2 are sources of the DAG, they can be sampled independently. Once you sample them, you can sample X3, which has only X1 and X2 as its parents, and so on and so forth. In general, uh, a distribution is factorized in terms of the parenthood relationship in relationships in your DAG by taking a product over all the nodes of sampling that node conditioning on the parents of that node. So pi of V are the parents of a node, and you get this factorization once I give you the DAG. Uh, uh, Right, so the question is, if you know that your distribution has this type of structure, this type of structure may come from the fact that, you know, your world has some conditional dependence property, like a, you know, a Markov chain. Or it could be by, you know, like finding that structure inside the architecture of your generator. Generators are ultimately deep neural nets that have some, that have some um, uh, structure. Okay, so you want to exploit either uh, the real world structure or the structure inside your design. But in any event, what do we know about discriminating 
base nets. Do we need to pay this exponentiality uh, in the dimension that is the number of nodes in the DAG, or can we get away uh, without that? So, uh, in some uh, work that I did uh, last year, we looked at this problem um, from a statistical uh, viewpoint. So, our goal was to compare two base nets uh, of, uh, uh, that sample distributions in n dimensions, but have some bound on the n degree of the, of the DAG. And what we noticed, and you know, you don't need to look at the details, is that the effective dimensionality of these things is not n, the uh, number of nodes, but d, the n degree of the uh, of the uh, base nets. Okay, so degree can actually give you some leverage in uh, uh, in reducing the sample requirements to compare uh, high-dimensional distributions. So, in particular, you are linear in the dimension. And exponential in the n degree, and uh, you know, all these dependencies are optimal. You cannot escape them unless you make more assumptions. In fact, with extra assumptions, you can reduce n to root n, as shown by the paper by Canon et al. Now, ultimately, the way you prove such, uh, you, the way you you know you leverage the structure of the GAN of the base net to uh, improve the discrimination is you prove these nice uh, theorems, you prove some localization type of results that try to argue the following. They try to argue that if your high dimensional distributions are far from each other, then there are small size witnesses for that distance. In other words, it cannot be that your distributions as n dimensional distributions are far without there being a subset of uh, a small number of dimensions where they're already far. You cannot smear distance you know, across many dimensions without there being a witness that is low dimensional. Okay? And uh, how low dimensional that witness is depends on the n degree, as it turns out, as you can establish by uh, basically um, proving subarditivity theorems for distances okay? that look uh, like the ones that I'm showing here on the board. Right? So, uh, the first line says that the KL between two base nets, P and Q, is upper bounded by the sums of KLs, uh, of little KLs, that involve a node and his parents in the DAG. And similar results uh, can be shown for TV and Hellinger distance. And these are enough to actually, in fact, this is what we use in the paper, to uh, run a test in TV, we actually have to use uh, subarditivity in Hellinger distance. Now, the question is, can we leverage these types of uh, localization arguments to scale up uh, GAN training? So let's go back to our Wasserstein distance. Is the proof against the fact that you're dealing with base nets or only the fact that uh, distances are? Uh, so I yeah, if you want to compare to base nets, in TV as high dimensional distributions, we show by using this subarditivity that it suffices to check over all possible neighborhoods. If they're not far in any of the little neighborhoods, they must be, they must be close. They cannot be, uh, so you run a bunch of little tests as opposed to one big high dimensional test. Did you ask you that you know the graph? Not no, you don't need to actually, yeah. You only need a degree bound. Okay, so uh, again, these tests were in TV. The question is, you know, can you leverage these ideas to test in Wasserstein, which is what we want for image and video and whatever generation? The question is, does Wasserstein satisfy a similar subarditivity property? As it turns out, it doesn't. Okay, so you can come up even with like, you know, Markov chains on three dimensions that uh, have, you know, like, uh, Wasserstein's between of consecutive nodes be small, while Wasserstein between the triplet of all three dimensions be large. So you cannot use this idea directly, but you can, you know, as is shown in, you know, in this preliminary work with Andrew Elias, you can uh, show subarditivity if you also assume that uh, the conditional densities are, are ellipses in the, what you condition on. So if, you, if they're ellipses, you get subarditivity for both Markov chains and and base nets, 
And uh, you can now leverage these results to exploit uh, conditional independent structure of the distribution to scale up GANs. And in my last slide, I want to show you how that possibly can happen. Okay? So for now, let's, you know, let's, take this, let's just take this result as gra for granted that uh, Wasserstein uh, for Markov chains satisfies subadditivity. And let me show you how this could potentially be used. Okay? And again, this is my last slide. So here is an architecture that possibly can generate a video. So you have a generator that takes as input randomness and generates the first frame of your video. That first frame of the video, together with new randomness, is put into a new generator in another generator that outputs the second frame, and so on and so forth until you generate your whole video. Certainly, this architecture captures the Markov chain property that you know, maybe your you know, videos have. Yeah. Now, traditionally, the way you would uh, define a discriminator for this problem is you could, would collect all the frames together. That would be one generated sample. You would take also one video from your data base, which is another collection of frames. And you will pass this to, through a discriminator that, whose task is to discriminate between the distribution uh, of your model and the true distribution of your videos. And of course, as the number of frames goes to infinity, this task becomes harder and harder and harder because the dimensionality scales linearly with the number of frames you have in your video. On the other hand, you can, uh, and this is sort of like uh, what we are proposing, you can exploit subadditivity of Wasserstein distance to actually do the following instead. It, you don't need to compare video, whole video against whole video. All you need because of subadditivity is to compare consecutive frames of the generated video with consecutive frames from your database of videos. So what we suggest is to pull together you know, pairs of consecutive frames and you know, have a, a bunch of little discriminators whose task is to solve a much smaller discrimination problem, whose dimensionality scales as a factor of two with you know, in comparison to the dimensionality of each frame and not the number of frames. So in particular, you have, you know, now you don't have a game between a generator and a discriminator, but a generator and a bunch of discriminators that are hitting the, the generator, discriminating pairs of consecutive frames. This is a multiplayer zero-sum game, but uh, there is work, uh, some of it by me, uh, with Paparimitri and Yang Kai and uh, um, Ozan Kantogan, from, who used to be at MIT that uh, you know, argues that these multiplayer, separable multiplayer games are actually well behaved from the purposes of finding equilibria. So this architecture could potentially work. And uh, we did a little experiment uh, with a uh, video. So we generated, uh, we created a data database of videos. Our videos basically uh, put together uh, MNIST digits uh, in, 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 in weekly increasing order. So we created a database of videos that are of the form 0, 0, 1, 3, 3, uh, okay, so, but they have to be weekly increasing. And then we trained GANs either with a factorized or a non-factorized uh, discriminator to compare how fast we get accuracy. And this pre preliminary experiment, we got that, you know, factorization helps, okay? And you know, I, I, I really like this idea, and I think it has to be explored more. Because some factorized doesn't even interfere. Uh, no, I mean, uh, you see that you know they're not. I mean, in these preliminary experiments, you know, the green is the unfactor. I mean, we did only four, four frames. Okay, if you were to scale it up to like a uh, hundred frames, then uh, the green guy would be <laughs> worse. <laughs> Uh, it does. It, uh, it, it is linear in the number of nodes, so you're good. Yeah, but, but yeah, good point. Yeah. So typically, on the unfactorized one, do you find that it not, doesn't respect the weekly increasing problem? Excuse me? The unfactorized... Uh, it, it does. It also exists. It also does, yeah. And that's the whole point, that uh, uh, to, like, like it suffices to do pairs of consecutive frames to enforce something for the joint distribution. That's the point of subadditivity. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, 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 the unfactorized one, also you find that it generates... Yeah. Uh, yeah, in fact, this uh, is exactly tracking the probability uh, 
at different steps of training, the probability you violate the increasingness the, of, the, of, the, of the video. It's somewhat surprising, right? I mean, the, the top one, the factorized, looks at the larger class of uh, discriminators. The top one is the factorized. The bottom one is... Ah, uh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a larger class of discriminators. Uh, and yet you get, uh, so, so you would think that you know, if, I, if I'm good against this logic, uh, yeah. I'm actually it, it's, statistic, it's a statistical computational complexity uh, okay. uh, trade-off. And in that trade-off, uh, the factorized one wins. That's the, yeah. Uh, because it suffices to only do pairs of consecutive discriminations, and you need much less data to, fear data to do that. So in any event, you know, just to conclude, uh, uh, generative adversarial networks have found a lot of applications. There is a lot of excitement and a lot of debate about what exactly they're doing. And uh, what we propose here is, you know, taking a theoretical perspective to either try to improve, you know, the training procedure that is, you know, that people currently use for the current architectures, or propose methods to architect these things better to leverage uh, knowledge you may have about the underlying distribution. Uh, lots of interesting uh, open problems here, and I encourage you to take a look at them. Thank you.